Well, good morning. I will say that that's very difficult to follow. Keith, where are you? Brother, thank you for that uh, just heartfelt devotion. And uh, things of that nature that are so dear and near to our hearts. And, and I love the concept of relationship. And uh, I do a program that's built around an acronym. I do a lot of talks based on acronyms. And, uh, and I do a concept called RAPP. It's R-A-P-P. -P. And, and it's relationships, activities, pleasures, and potential. And that like the earth that rotates on its axis, relationships make the world go round. And round and round and round. And so I am a huge relationship focused person. And obviously, based on obviously your message this morning, I just wanted to say a few words in regards to it. That our greatest relationship is that one in which we have with Jesus. And then certainly we have what you call that vertical relationship between us and God. You know, we have that horizontal relationship with man. And so it's uh, all about relationships. You know, if in real estate, it's location, location, location. In life, it's relationships, relationships, relationships. And I appreciate uh, that uh, powerful devotion. I, I will say one last thing to it. I taught my son, and, and I mentioned last night my Dustin is, 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 out, is adopted. And um, I, I, I use that and say that just for information purposes. Uh, Dustin is as very much, uh, as much my blood son <laughs> as uh, my two daughters are. And uh, I fed him enough that he's become that. <laughs> So we don't see him any differently than we do uh, our daughters. And, and after all, I thought I heard someone say it the other night that, you know, we all are sons and daughters and adopted by God himself, huh? And that's not bad, is it? But I told Dustin when he was eight years old, I remember going to the garage. I got two points on this. Lots of stories this morning. I only have about 50 minutes. I'm going to hustle through football. You got to hustle. Okay, so I'm going to hustle this morning and try and cover as much ground as I can. But I told Dustin at eight years old, and there he is, a little, little skinny, little green bean. And, and I'm sitting on the, uh, and, and this is going to be really rich. I'm sitting on the little step when you go out of the hallway there and into the garage. And Dustin and I are sitting on the steps, just there on the steps. He's eight years old, and his little eyes looking up at me. And, and I told him something really important. I said, son... I want to make sure you know something. I, we covered several things, but one of the things I covered was that you don't ever have to steal anything from anyone. I said, if you want something, you earn it. You work for it. You roll up your sleeves and you go to work for it. I said, if you need something, you've got an anchor man at home that can help you get it if you deserve it and it's the right thing for you and it's appropriate. And so one of the high principles that I taught him was that the, the worst kind of person is the kind of person that takes something that doesn't belong to them. And there are lots of reasons for that and you mentioned one of those this morning. I remember telling one of the young men that attended Morehouse, Cammy, his car was broken into, and he called me. I mentored him for four and a half years, Randy. He called me, and, and he was just so down about it. it was, someone broke in his car and stole his computer and those kinds of things, and he was very regretful that he left those things in his vehicle. And, they broke his windows, got to get all that stuff taken care of and just more of an inconvenience than, than anything. And, um, 
And I, he called me and he said, Derek, I, I, you know, someone took my mother's charm that she had left in my car and, and he was very broken hearted, over, over, broken hearted over it. And the thing I said to him, I said, well, Randy, I am deeply sorry that that happened. And my heart goes out to you and certainly what that charm meant to you, uh, something from your mother. And I said, but I won't, I've got good news for you. I said, according to what I know, I said, nobody gets away. <laughs> uh, I said, we'll pray for that person that took it. We'll pray for them. But no one gets away. But the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro throughout the earth. God Almighty. And he sees everything. And our hope is that that person comes to a saving relationship with our Savior. We're going to pray for him. And so what we began to do is pray for the thief. <laughs> because he needs prayer. <laughs> anyway, I love the devotion. <laughs> I just wanted to park there for a quick moment. And uh, Keith highlight some of those neat things. When you walk in a coaches meeting, we're going to turn this into a coaching meeting, okay? Are y'all with me? My special teams coach, Frank Gans from the Detroit Lions, the late Frank Gans, he's since passed on, dear friend of mine, Frank would walk into a team meeting and he'd begin talking about Sunday's game. And he'd begin to coach on various principles about what just take, took place. If we were in Chicago or Green Bay or some of those places, and Frank would walk in a meeting, and of course on Sunday we played the game, and our team, you know, we're all thinking about our performance. <laughs> and we're thinking about the things we did well, but we're also very knowledgeable of the things we didn't do very well. Frank knew this, <laughs> and so he would torture us with it. Oh, he'd take his time. And we'd all be sitting in the team meeting room much like this. Meeting starts at 8 o'clock. Frank would intentionally not come in until 8.15. He knew we were stewing over what happened Sunday. And Frank would walk in the room and he'll do much like this. And you guys are seated as teammates. And Frank would walk in the room and he had this thing. And he'd walk in and say, good morning, my good men. Good morning. And he'd walk into the room and he'd come to the thing and, and he'll stand and he'll focus with everyone. He'd say, folks, I want to tell you that I love you dearly. <laughs> I care about each and every one of you very particular. I'm very fond of you, Brother Moore. He called me Brother Moore. Brother Moore, you're one of the best people I know. I admire you tremendously. He said, but we're here this morning to talk about some very particular things and some of them are very aggressive. And he'd go to his board, he's already written it up, and he'll say H-H-H-S. Now, I'm not going to translate what that S means. <laughs> Can I be transparent? He would say, we've got some heavy, heavy, heavy stuff to cover this morning. Let your imaginations go. <laughs> heavy, heavy, heavy. The talk about this morning. And he'd start every meeting that way. It's some heavy stuff. And then he'd say, you know, Brother Moore, and he always led with the persons that he felt like didn't really do what they were supposed to do on Sunday. Oh, man, and he kept saying, he said, Brother Moore, three times, and I said, I touched the guy next to me. Oh, man, I'm in trouble this morning, man. <laughs> God Almighty. And Frank was very famous for being very upfront with you. He said, I had some tough negotiations this morning. He said, my good men, I'm here to make you better. We want you to perform at your most outstanding level. That's the way he would communicate these things. And I'm sweating. <laughs> I'm sweating. He said, we have some problems this morning. And we must take care of them. He would say, I want you to know, Brother Moore, I care about you dearly. And he'd walk up to us. And he'd say, I want you to know something this morning, that I'm not attacking you. You are a fine young man. 
<laughs> this morning I'm going to attack your problems. <laughs> oh yes, Brother Moore. I enjoyed that dinner we had last week and just a neat outing and I met Miss Stephanie. What a fine gal you have. He would say, but I'm here this morning to attack some problems and Brother Moore, you've got some problems and anything that keeps us from performing at our most outstanding level, we define that as a problem, Brother Moore. And he walked back to his podium. We have some problems to attack. Frank was pretty impressive in how he would deliver things. And so in every team meeting, we'd have some heavy, heavy, heavy stuff to cover. And so this morning, I want to cover some heavy stuff. <coughs> My high school teacher, Miss Majid, was famous for telling us this, and I've taught my children this all the time. So when you go to class, always pay attention, focus. And when the teacher goes to the board, begin to write something on the board, Mr. Majid often said, if I write it on the board, it's important. And so I was really trained to take notes all the time. And so I was a famous note taker. And so if it's written on the board, Mr. Majid said, it's important and you might need to find a way to log it away. All the lessons we learn over the years. And so I'm a note taker. I tell my son that if you're going to be successful in class, when you go to college, I said, you know, professors are not quite like high school teachers. I said to him that they are, you know, they may not even care that you're in the class. You, it's likely they won't call roll. And I said, you're going to be responsible for your work. You're going to be responsible for your assignments. You're going to be responsible for your grades. And so as a result, you're going to have to take notes, and if he or she writes it on the board, and then you're going to be a, a great note taker of verbal connotations because there are certain things that's going to be said that you're going to have to make notes of, mental notes, and you're going to have to write things down. And so it's a principle of learning that I think has served well in our home over the years. What I want to do first is tell you some stories quickly about a, an organization and, and about an individual. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what's on the board and cover some other small things and I'll be done. One of the things that has always impressed me about the NFL in particular, an organization that I had the good privilege of playing for for a brief stint, was the San Francisco 49ers. And I played in the era which were the 90s with Jerry Rice and Steve Young and some of those folks played. You may be familiar with those names. And out in Santa Clara, where the 49ers organization is, you walk into their facility and they've got those five Super Bowl trophies highlighted in the foyer of their complex. And there's a sign over it that says the 49er way. And it's a way in which the 49ers do things. They are a very perfectionist organization. Now, I had the good privilege of leaving Detroit. I was backing up Barry Sanders for two years, and, and I had a great game on a Monday night against the 49ers, and lo and behold, they remembered it, and I became a free agent. And as a result, they brought me over to San Francisco to replace Ricky Waters, and the 49ers just won a Super Bowl, and I was coming in to replace Ricky Waters. But I quickly learned that there's a way to lead. You know, there's a concept of leadership. Someone said that if you were leading and you look behind you and no one's following, then you're just taking a walk. I've also learned, and now I'll say this, and I'm not suggesting that you'll agree with me. Frank Gans will tell you, my good man, I'm not here to make, you, make sure you agree with me. <laughs> I've got some very particular things to say, I'm going to say them. Well, sometimes 
You can be a great leader but have poor followers. Think about that for a moment. It's not always suggested that because no one's following that you are not a great leader. Jesus was the greatest leader that's ever been. He also had some poor followers. <laughs> so it's not only important to be a great leader, but it's also important to be a great follower. And before you can lead, you should follow. The 49ers' way was incredible. Jerry Rice set the pace for that. Uh, work ethics were extraordinary. And they re really had a culture of team leadership. And it permeated itself from the executive offices all the way down to the custodial office. And it was a culture of how things were done. And so the expectation was that everyone led. And that if you were a follower, you quickly became a leader. And it was the 49er way. And so the entire culture is a culture of doing things a certain way. There's a certain standard of doing things. And I love because when I went to our first practice and I watched Jerry Rice practice, he set the template for what everyone else needed to do. Arguably the greatest receiver to ever play the game. And Jerry would take off in practice and run routes and every pass he caught, he'd run 40 yards down the field after he caught it. Jogged back to the hole and he was ready to go again. His conditioning level was exemplary. When practice was over, Jerry would rerun the routes that he failed at during the team sessions or individual sessions. He wouldn't leave the field until he perfected every route. Everything he did was at the highest level. And everyone else had to bring their game up to that level, or you couldn't keep up. It was the 49 away. Move on. I had the good fortunes of playing with Barry Sanders. Woo! Boy, do I have stories, Mr. Parker. And by the way, I do want to thank you so much again for uh, giving me an opportunity to be here. Thank you for uh, Scotty and uh, the work he's done in making that possible, as Scotty mentioned a moment ago, in such short notice. And um, I, I, I just, I'm used to being a backup. <laughs> <laughs> I was the most famous backup in the world. I got back to my room last night and I called Barry Sanders. And I said, Barry, I'm talking about you again. And he laughed. <laughs> said, I'm at a neat meeting here at Hilton Head. And uh, I'm going to share a few Barry Sanders stories in the morning. He said, don't talk about me too bad now. <laughs> but I was the most famous backup there's ever been. You know, it's a good thing to be a backup. Boy, I carry that helmet for him, Barry. You need me to carry your helmet? <laughs> Once I saw him play, oh, oh. He's something, five, ten and a half, probably, frail and lean. He could do things that you can't even imagine. He did more great things in practice than he ever did on television on a Sunday. I want to give you three quick stories. I get to the Lions, and amazingly, amazingly, there's only two running backs on the roster. Wayne Fonts is our head coach. And, you know, I'm one of those people that, like, I'm a question asker. I'll ask questions, things that look, I'll just come up and ask. 
I was brand new to the team. I would not seen Barry as of yet. I just arrived. They put my locker right next to him. And I just stood in the locker. I said, oh, can some of this fall on me? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And sure enough, next day I met him. He came in just quiet and just humble. And uh, he was so kind. And I'll tell you a story about that. It's one of my three stories. But I went to Wayne Fonts and I said, Coach Fonts, I'm curious. I've noticed there's only two running backs on the roster. And he has an office just outside of the locker room. His executive office is upstairs. He was in his office down at the locker room. And I said, Coach Fonts, I'm just curious. There's only two running backs. We've got 16 games to play. Can you believe I'm telling him this? We've got 16 games to play, and it's only two running backs. And I was just curious, who, where are the other running backs? And because for me, I'm not worried about Barry. Barry is Barry. But I've got to compete against the other guys. I can't compete against him. And sure enough, I wanted to kind of know who I'm up against. And Coach Font said, we've got seven backs. He said, he said, come here, let me show you something. He walks me out in the locker room and he points up at Barry Sanders' locker. And he said, you see that number 20? I said, yes, sir. He said, you've got to count him six times. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Derek, you have a math problem. <laughs> Incredible. You know, I remember playing against Green Bay and Barry makes a run. Oh man, there's nothing like it. He makes a run. There are three defenders, one here, one here, and one here. And we run what we call a stretch play, where we're gonna bring the ball. Scott Mitchell is gonna reach out and bring Barry the ball here at depth level. Barry gets the ball, and those three backers converge on him. We're at our own 20-yard line, and they converge on him. And we're all standing on the sidelines. And we're always amazed at some of the things he does. But he comes, and he gets that stretch. And those jokers converged on him, and he stopped. He literally stopped, and he looked at them. <laughs> oh, I tell you, I kid you not. And he does something that the human body is not supposed to do. He backed up. <laughs> he just backs up. He backs up and then he stabs at him and he gets around the outside. He goes 80 yards whoo, down the field. And here's what's amazing. Here's what's amazing. The entire sideline, the, the dome is going nuts. 80,000. Barry, Barry, Barry. They're going nuts. And here he comes, coming to the sidelines. And there are lots of conversations going on. Everybody. My God, did you just see that? <laughs> wow. Man, did that just happen? No one, he comes to the sidelines and no one says anything to him. He goes and sits down on the bench and he had a sleeping disorder. He wore dark visors because Barry would just fall asleep on the sidelines. <laughs> You just nap. And, and we go wake him up when the offense is time to go. There, a time for the offense, and he'll go out and run 80 yards. Phew! But I come to the bench and I sit next to him and I nudge him and I said, Wow, what was that, man? How in the world did you get out of that? He looked at me and he just did this. He was so gifted. He had more talent in one leg than I had in my whole body. But yet he was so humble. His ego was in check. His pride never rose higher than his humanity. He was a gentleman. My first, my third day there, I had no transportation. 
no car, no place to live. I was living in the hotel, and he didn't know me at all. And he said, Derek, I don't know if you care to, but I have a car at home, second car. You can drive it if you like until you're able to get settled and all those things. He said, I also have a condo that I don't use. I use it when my folks come in town for games. And he says, I'll bring the key tomorrow and you can, you can use it anytime you want to. And he gave me the condo keys and he gave me the key to the car. And I had it for probably a month. You know, I didn't know him from Adam. Uh, I'll tell you one last story. I I'm still good on my time. We got to get to the board, don't we? <laughs> Are you wondering what that's all about? Well, what's amazing is that uh, funny story. Barry Sanders, every Monday they give us our checks. And uh, I was, uh, I mean, I'm one of those guys I, just kind of making my way and I've not gotten a big contract as of yet, you know. Now, that depends on what you consider big. You know, for most folks, any NFL salary is a pretty big salary. And uh, I was making, oh, 300000 in that year with the Lions. And, um, and I got my first check there, Cammy. And sure enough, I was fired up. Oh, man. Whoa. $8,000, I'll get that every month. I mean, every week, every Monday. Eight grand, oh man, look at those zeros. Look the way they move around. <laughs> Woo, I fired up. I said, man, and I'm sitting in my locker with my check. Oh man, because back then, you know, I didn't have direct deposit and I didn't do all those, so I had the physical check in my hand and they just come by the lockers, the guy upstairs, our financial guy, and he just drop a check in each locker and he drop a check in each locker and he just keeps going and he dropped one in Barry's locker. <laughs> and there I am sitting in my locker, boy, Mr. Parker, I'm fired up. Man, look at that, woo -hoo. boy. And Barry comes, he comes out of the shower and he comes in and he says, Demo, man, what's so, what's, you're excited about something. <laughs> to know Bear, he had a great sense of humor. I mean, I, he's the most amazing person you'll ever want to meet. A Hall of Famer, international superstar, and you'll never know it. You'll never know it. Let me tell you something. His actions spoke louder than anything he ever said. But, I, but he looks at me and says, man, you're fired up. I said, Bear, look, man, I got to. I said, man, my first check, the Lions, and I said, man, $8,000, man. He said, wow, <laughs> what are you going to do with it? <laughs> I said, man, I said, man, I'm going to send something to my mom, and man, I'm going to go do a few, put a little deposit, going to invest a little bit, and those kinds of things. He said, D. Moore, he said, look at mine. <laughs> He said, look at my, tell me, tell me, tell me what I got, tell me what I got. <laughs> now, this is not arrogance, okay? This is the comedian in Barry. This is the, com the comedy. Anybody else, you'd probably be insulted. But to know Barry is to know that's Barry. And he's just having fun with you. He said, look at my, tell me what I got, Demo, tell me. And I said, and I'm sitting there, I said, hmm. I was, I was curious, though, I was curious. I said, give it here, give it here, let me open it, Barry. <laughs> And I open it. Three hundred thousand dollars. I like to pass out. Oh my God. He said, Demo, what do you think I can do with it? What do you think I can do with it? I, I use those stories to highlight the humility of a man that I met years ago. And I'll use this phrase to describe these letters. 
B-Y-G-I-D-M-Y-D-G-I. Know what that means? Because you got it, doesn't mean you don't get it. You get that? Because you got it, doesn't mean you don't get it. Barry Sanders had it, but he also got it. He gets it. What did he get? He understood because I am who I am and I'm gifted the way I am. He never believed in an entitled mentality. Because I am who I am and what I've accomplished, I don't walk around feeling like I'm entitled. He could have very well taken that approach and in the high profile business of the NFL, there are a lot of guys who live with an entitlement. Very arrogant, very cocky, and the sun doesn't come up until they get up in the morning. But Barry was very intentional with how gifted he was, but, as, but one of the things that he made certain of is that he never made you feel like you were insignificant, you were not important, that you had no value, and that you brought something to the team. I highlight this for you. As great a running back as he was, Barry, Barry knew this and our organization knew it. I was famous for being Barry's backup. And they say, what does that mean? That means when Barry gets tired, get injured, or any of those things, I would go in. When I first did that, Barry and the offense drove the ball down to the two-yard line. And the first time I entered the game in the Silver Dome, they took Barry out in the crowd. Ooh, what are they doing? And they didn't know me, and I took the field because I had something that Barry didn't. Can you imagine that? <laughs> but we discovered that Barry wasn't very good in tight quarters, particularly on the goal line when the, when the defense constricts the field. Barry wants to get you out in space and do damage to you, but he struggled going downhill. When Barry got the ball, you're gonna see the offensive linemen. Oh, it's the most amazing thing, Mr. Parker. They, the offensive linemen, they're blocking, but they're looking. They don't know where he is. They don't know, they don't know where he is. He could be coming left, and you look up, he's way over here. So the linemen in Detroit could never be physical and aggressive. They're, they're always very passive, and people say, oh, he didn't have an offensive line. Well, the offensive line never knew where he was. Well, when Big Boy got in the game, if it's a 36 blast, you can count on it, buddy. I'm going to be at the six hole. Count on it. <laughs> <coughs> I wasn't running all over here. And sure enough, when we got on the goal line, I had a characteristic that was a strength to our program. I could drive that ball downhill and get physical and pound it in the end zone. And Detroit found that to be a valuable asset to its organization. Do what you do, know what you do, know your strengths, and know that you have the ability to make a contribution. It might not be his contribution, and it might not be her contribution, but I'm here for a reason, and I have value, and I can be a difference maker with this organization. I can be a difference maker. And I'm not treated, I'm not treated insignificantly. I've just needed to find my role, Define my role and work my role. And every time we got it on the goal line, one of the most beautiful things took place. We were in Detroit, we were in Minnesota. I'll tell you all kinds of stories for you. Quick one here. And we've got it on the goal line. It's one second to go in the ball game. We're down by four points. Oh, wow. Barry Sanders. And I said, this game is too important. There's no way they're going to pull Barry out now. And sure enough, we got to the goal line, and we do this here. That's called heavy, 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 heavy. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it's called. Heavy, heavy, heavy. And heavy offense goes into the game. Two big tight ends, 6'6", 6 6'6", 6 270. You know, 
Big fullback, we take Chris Spielman, inside linebacker, Ohio State, Detroit Lions, move him to the fullback position. I'm the big tailback, I'm 230 pounds. Barry Sanders goes out of the game, it's fourth and one, and there's one second left, and, we, and we're down by four points. We win, we, we, we get it in, we win, we don't, we go home. Sure enough, they call the play, it's heavy, it's, wow. Listen, it's 52 blasts, and I'm gonna show you another one in a moment on the board. And Spielman leads up inside, and I blow that thing over the right the right guard and stick that thing in the end zone and the Metrodome gets quiet. And I came back to the sideline and one of my team members said this, Demo, we knew you were gonna get it in. We knew it. It's wonderful when the organization puts the rock in your hands. You know, in every organization, every single one of you with one life You've got the ball. Golly. And at various moments and times, it's your job to carry it across the goal line. But you can be trusted with it because we've seen what you've done in the past. And so they trusted that I would get it in and it was one of the highest compliments and one of the most sincere sense of feelings I had when my teammates told me they knew I'd get it in. And sure enough, we accomplished it. So leadership and teamwork go hand in hand here. It's a corporate or comprehensive effort within the context of the team. B-Y-G-I-D-M-Y-D-G-I. Keep that in mind as we go forward. I want to close like this. Fifty-two ISO. This play requires a lot of commitment from a lot of people. You got to put your pride aside. You got to put your ego on the side of the field. You really do. Your selfishness, you got to move it out of the way. Because 52 ISO is all about team leadership. Our goal on 52 ISO, four to six yards every time we run it. There are goals within your organization, I'm certain, that you have. And as you go out, and particularly in sales, there are some goals and objectives that you probably want to meet. And I believe there are standards of excellence and things that you want to walk away from or walk away with. And what we want to do with 52 ISO is walk away with four to six yards. But it's going to take some unique things happening to make that possible. It's our bread and butter. Whenever we want to get four to six yards, we're going to go to this play. Okay? But here's what's important. Are y'all ready for a little football coaching up? Ladies, hang in there with me. <laughs> unique stuff here, I know. My wife laughs at me when I'm teaching her these things. Here's what you have. You have, you have linemen, you have the backs and quarterback, you've got two wide receivers here on the, on the offense. It's a certain kind of personnel. Some of us call it 22 personnel in today's systems. But what we're going to talk about here is learning the defense. First, you've got to know your opponent. You've got to know your competitor. You've got to know who and what you're up against. We've got a nine technique over the defensive end. We've got a three technique over the guard. We've got a nose tackle in a one shade. We have a, we have a defensive end and an outside five. We've got, two, we've got three backers inside. They have responsibilities on defense. This guy's what you call a B-gap defender. This guy here's what you call an A-gap defender. This guy, nope, this guy here's an A-gap defender. The tackle's a B-gap defender. He's an A-gap defender. This guy here is a C-gap defender. The end is a contained guy. He's going to keep you from getting outside. We've got to know that offensively. We got to know what they're doing. So we've got to be knowledgeable. These corners, they're probably locked up in man coverage. You've got two high safeties. Sometimes they can rotate the strong safety down in the box. Y'all with me? Oh, yeah. Now, we've got A gap, A gap, B gap, B gap, C gap, contain, B gap, C gap, contain outside. Okay? 
Now, what's real important, we've got our quarterback, our fullback, and our halfback here. That was me. Oh, boy. <laughs> mm -mm. What we want to do offensively, we want to do strategically, we want to isolate that guy. We want to put him on an island where he has no friends. He has no support. And we want to make him make the play. That's what we want to do. So we want to put him on an island. So if we're going to put him on an island, we've got to eliminate some people. And what we're going to do first, if we're going to run 52, two to the strong side, the right side, three would be to the left side. We're going to ISO right here is where we want to go with the football. ISO step. We want to go right here with the football. But what's got to happen here is that there's got to be some things very important that everybody's got to understand. And I want to make sure I cover those as I get to our closing. The number one rule in football, tell me what you might think the number one rule in football is. Protect the football. Protect the football. That's a good one. Give me another. Teamwork. Huge and very close to the answer. Give me another. Say it again. Do your assignment or take care of your responsibility. You know what the problem in a lot of our culture is? Is that everybody wants to do somebody else's job. Isn't that interesting? Our, your job isn't good enough. Or you feel like you can tell the other person how to do their job better than they can do their job. And so what that really means is, is that there's no trust in the organization. So you don't trust that person well enough to do his job. So you're going to do his job for him while you still have to do your job. But if you try to do his job and do your job, you're not going to do your job well and the job's not going to get done. The number one rule in football is to do your job take care of your responsibility, and leave everyone else's responsibility up to them. Because that's where trust comes in. We with that one? Number one rule. Well, let's, let's break ISO down. What's important is the quarterback has got to put his ego aside. See that? Because you know what the quarterback can do? He'll walk to the line of scrimmage, and what he'll do, he'll see that front, and sometimes he'll audible. He'll want to get out of the play. The coordinator has said, we've got to stay with it. It'll go. And sometimes the quarterback will walk to the line of scrimmage, and he'll want to get into something else that he wants to do. But we've got to stay in this look. So he's got to put his ego aside and do what the play is called. The running backs can't be selfish. In other words, if we've got to get it to the two hole, we cannot afford him to cut back. If he cuts it back, he's going to get hit in the mouth by this B-gap defender. Particularly if the guard is trying to reach him to the outside, and I'll show you where he's going. So he can't get selfish in his point of, of, of attack. And then lastly, these guys out here has got to put their pride away. And they've got to block. They've got to put it away. And it's all about team. It's all about team leadership. And so here's ISO. What we're going to try and do here to make this thing go and to get four to six yards, we've got to put this guy on an island. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to work to double team this cat right here. This three technique is one of the most nastiest dominant players in football. They put the best defensive lineman at the three technique. He plays to the strong side of the, of the system. you got to know where the talent is now. A guy named Warren Sapp used to play this position. He was a man now. Oh, he could play it. We're, but what we would do, we had a guard right here that weighed 320 pounds. We had Lutz. Big Dave Lutz was 350, 6'7". And we take 320 pounds, 350 pounds, and we put it on 310. All right, that's going to make you feel. <laughs> we'll double team him right here, and they'll get hip to hip, Scotty. They'll put those big rear ends together. You know one of the things I found fascinating? In high school, when my son plays, from tackle to tackle, Mr. Parker, 
the offensive line looks like that. In college, where I work at Georgia Tech, the offensive line looks like that. In the NFL, it looks like that. <laughs> oh, it's amazing the size of those rear ends. Whoa! Man! But anyway, we're going to double team that three technique, okay? We got to double team him or it won't go. We've got to make the sale. And if we're going to make the sale, we've got to get these very particular things done and you can't negotiate them. Four to six yards, we got to have them, Scotty. We're going to double team the three technique. And when he double teams him, he's going to turn the guard loose on him and let him have him. The tackler's going to work to the next level to get the backer. We can't afford him to run into the hole. We can't let him do it. He runs in the hole and he destroys the ISO. So this 350-pound tackle has got a double team and they've got to push that three. God, it's a beautiful thing. I get excited talking about it. Whoa, they've got to come hip to hip and they've got to push that guard. And they've got to drive him up the field. Tackle's got to release and go to the next level and get the backer. The backer right here, the tight end is going to tip the defensive end and he's going to work to the safety. Are y'all with that? What's happening over here? The center is going to turn the nose away. It's what's going to happen there. Here, the guard's going to work to cut the backer off. We're going to turn the end. The safety here is going to start streaming down the alley. We're going to cut the cornerback off. We're going to cut the cornerback off. The number one rule in football is what? Take care of your what? Responsibility. The number one rule in any organization is to know your job, know your role, and to take care of your responsibility. Because you get to looking around, you know, it's a biblical thing to that. Peter started looking around. And Jesus said, You can walk on water. And Peter started, those waves start. And Peter started. If you stay focused on your responsibility, and your responsibility is to walk, not to look around. Oh, it's not to look around. I know you want to try to fix everybody's problems, but you can't fix them. They have a responsibility. They have a responsibility, and they've got to do it. They've got to do their job. And so what's happening here in ISO, is he almost isolated or is he isolated now? Have we isol isolated him? Yeah. He's by himself, isn't he? Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> you don't have your friends anymore. We've isolated big boy here. This guy right here is about 250 pounds in the NFL now. The Mike linebacker, my son plays this position here. He's a big, bad, nasty guy. Ray Lewis, that's who that is. He's the toughest, meanest guy on the defense. You know him from Dick Buckus to... Oh, gracious me. And they can run from sideline to sideline. He has no problem filling this hole and mixing it up with you. So what we're going to do is isolate him. The fullback is going to go get him. He's going to go get him. I used to break the huddle in Carolina, and Bob Christian, I don't know if you know that name, Bob Christian played fullback for the Falcons. He was my fullback in Carolina. Bobby and I would be in the huddle, and Kerry Collins would call the play, and we'll break the huddle, and Bobby and I look at him, look at each other, He'll say, you ready to ride, Big Daddy? I'm going to go get him. <laughs> Love it. Oh, man, I get fired up talking about it. But here we go. We're going to ISO that backer, and here come Bobby. There's still somebody's unblocked. Who's unblocked? The safety's unblocked. In every organization, you've got to know what's missing. You've got to know what the next step is, the next stage is. You got to know who to eliminate. You got to know what opportunity to seize. And we realize the safety is unblocked. Who's going to block him? Yeah, say it again. Oh, say it again, Mr. Parker. I'm going to run him over, buddy. I'm going to run him over. That guy is mine. He's all mine. He's all mine. I can imagine when you're in the sales opportunity, you got to walk in there and know that that's all yours. We're going to make the sale. I've got this guy. Am I either going to give him some of this 
I'm going to take that 230 pounds. Here's a problem he's got. He's about a buck 90. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee you he don't eat his Cheerios. <laughs> he's got a problem. This guy right here is 230 pounds. Fire breathing dragon. And I'm going to meet him in the alley. And we ain't going to be singing Kumbaya. <laughs> I guarantee it. And the ISO is going to go, and it's only going to go if this guy and that 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 guy takes care of their responsibilities. And if they take care of their responsibilities, this thing is going to go. It's going to go, folks. And when we don't get four to six, it's because somebody has a problem. My good man, we're going to attack your problem this morning. We need you to take care of your responsibility. If you take care of your responsibility, we're going to get to where we're going to get to. And we're going to be highly successful. And we're going to win the day. We're going to win the play. Oh, but you've got to get your ego out of the way. You can't be a selfish player. Your pride, you've got to put it aside. And every man's got to abandon himself and focus on the objective of the team. And every man has to decide that he wants to lead. If the tight end leads, if the tackle leads, if the guard leads, if the center leads, if the guard leads, if the tackle leads, if the quarterback leads, if the fullback leads, if the back leads, if the receiver leads, if the receiver leads. Whatever you want, you got it. Whatever you want, you got it. Thank you very much this morning.